الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. All praise is due to Allah and may the peace and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa taala be upon our last Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. Let's let's keep the lights on for now. I like to see people, beautiful people. Alhamdulillah. Uh, first of all, it's it's an honor and pleasure to really be here on this panel with with uh, some very esteemed people. Uh, beautiful stories from both of our previous two speakers, and uh, of course we have a beautiful moderator. <laughs> but it's an honor and pleasure to be on this panel, and it's an honor and pleasure really to be here in London to share with you my journey to Islam. Uh, and give you some insight about uh, some of my experience as a Muslim convert, or as some people might say, Muslim revert. And I did want to also, within the 25 minutes that I've been allotted, also give you some insight into my experience as a former U.S. Army Muslim chaplain who served in Guantanamo Bay, uh, a very unique prison in an of its elf in its own right and uh, hopefully give you a little bit of insight in in, uh, in my experience there so I might know a little too the thing about prison myself and I'll elaborate but let me get down to a uh, real quick real quick background third generation Chinese American my grandparents immigrated from South China to the United States in the early 1920s uh, both of my parents, born in the United States. My dad is 85 years old. Born in the United States in 1927. Right. Both of my older sisters, my two younger brothers, also born in the U.S., myself as well. And in the Asian community, when we say Asian in America, it really refers to the East Asian. Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, Vietnamese. I know here in England and the U.K., when you say Asian, uh, we, South Asian, right, Southeast Asian. But in the Asian community in America, we say that's third generation. The immigrant community, the first, my parents' generation, then my generation, third generation. You heard I have a military background. A former chaplain of the U.S. military. I actually also served prior, prior to that as a, an air defense artillery officer in the U.S. Army. I graduated from West Point, the prestigious United States Military Academy. And I also now come from a family that has its roots in the military. My younger brother is also a graduate of West Point. My other br younger brother has also served in the U.S. Army as uh, uh, an Army doctor. And my dad, who I indicated is a U.S.-born citizen, also served in the U.S. military in the U.S. Army when he was drafted during World War II. Right. So all the men, all of the males in my family have served the U.S. Army and in some way, shape, or form have made contributions to this idea, this concept that we call national security. Uh, third generation Chinese American, former military, also Muslim converts. As some might say, Muslim reverts. I converted to Islam back in 1991, shortly after graduating from West Point, the military academy, and I converted uh, at a time when I really didn't know anything about Islam. And let me tell you about how I came to Islam. It was shortly after I graduated the academy when I found myself in what you might call interfaith dialogue. A mere exchange with another college student about faith, about beliefs, individual beliefs. I had been raised Christian, Lutheran, which is one of the more liturgical Protestant denominations, very close to Catholicism. Shortly after I graduated West Point, I found myself in this dialogue with another student, a student who herself was studying about Islam and was on the verge, was on the edge of herself becoming Muslim. But in this dialogue, I was merely asked what I thought about this concept of simply believing in one God. Not worshipping Jesus, as I had been learn, or brought up in the Christian faith, believing in this doctrine of the Trinity. Right? 
And being Christian at that time, my immediate reaction was, that's misguidance. But the next question that came was, well, what do I know about Islam? And my response was, I don't know anything about Islam. And then the comment was made, how could I judge something as misguidance if I knew nothing about it? And that made sense to me. I had gone to the academy, I had graduated, I was now a young officer in the U.S. Army, a lieutenant. That made sense to me, complete sense. How could I judge something if I didn't know anything about it? Right. So it was the next step that I took personally to go to a bookstore, to buy a book, a general book about Islam and just learn a little bit about what Islam is. <coughs> Maybe I had some intentions. Like our sister had to maybe come back and say later, see, this is why I don't accept Islam. Right? But what was intriguing when I learned something about Islam was to find that Islam was not very different from what I already believed in as a Christian. Right? The core belief in Christianity is to believe in the, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Isa alayhi salatu was salam. A core aspect of the Christian faith. And as I learned a little bit of Islam, it was very new to me. It was intriguing that there were others who also believed in the virgin birth of Christ. Muslims, I didn't know that. As I learned a little more, I recognized the familiar names, Abraham, Moses, David, Joseph, Noah, Jesus, the tradition of Jesus was found in Islam. These were names that I was already familiar with that I had learned as a youngster in Sunday school, learning about Christian biblical stories. They were also within the traditions of Islam. This was new to me. And I said, wow, Muslims are very close to what I believe in as, as a Christian. Right. Then of course I learned about Muhammad and the message, the oneness that he brought sallallahu alayhi wasallam, that it followed the, the same tradition as the prophets prior to him. Those who I already knew from my upbringing as a Christian. Right? So it was very easy, easy for me as someone who was not very religious as a, a young man to make that conversion, to make that acceptance of Islam. And when I did, when I became Muslim, when I said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, for me, I thought I would be practicing Islam as I was already practicing Christianity. I was a young man, Christian. I wasn't a religious Christian. I didn't go to church every Sunday. I wasn't involved in Bible studies throughout the week. I was just a simple Christian. And when I became Muslim, I took that same approach. I'm just going to be a simple Muslim. I knew Muslims, we pray five times a day. We fast Ramadan. We make that intention to go to Hajj, pilgrimage. When I became Muslim, I said, I'm just going to be a simple Muslim. I saw others immediately being plunged into a new faith and learning very quickly. I saw others who made more than just five prayers a day. They made sunnah prayers, they prayed at night. I saw others who were fasting, not in Ramadan, on Mondays and Thursdays, or maybe there were other brothers who were fasting every other day. There were people I met who had gone to Hajj. And I would hear that question, how many times have you made Hajj? Once, two, three, four, many times. But when I became Muslim, I was like, you only have to make Hajj once. So I'm going to be a simple Muslim. One day I'll go and make Hajj. But it was only five months later, as a young lieutenant, Shipped off to Germany where I was serving my first duty assignment. And from Germany we got orders to deploy to Saudi Arabia. This was in 1991 in the aftermath of the first Gulf War. The conflict had already ended but we got our orders. There was some talk that maybe there would be a second bombing of Baghdad. That never occurred, alhamdulillah. But nevertheless my unit, a Patriot missiles unit was sent to Saudi Arabia. And now I was in Saudi Arabia had only converted to Islam five months earlier on the American compound where we were based on the King Abdulaziz air base there was a huge tent some people refer to it as a camel tent 
But in front of this tent, there was a sign that said, Saudi Cultural Center. Saudi Cultural Center. And there were some Saudi citizens in there, on the American compound. And they just opened the doors of the tent, or what you might call the flaps of the tent, as soldiers would come in and learn about Saudi culture. But the dialogue always went back to faith and Islam. And as a result of that Saudi cultural center, aka Dawa center, <laughs> maybe 5,000, maybe 7,000 American soldiers converted to Islam as a result of being in the Gulf during the first Gulf War. Not many people know that. By the time I was there, there was a notebook, a three ring binder notebook about this thick. Each page was a short biography of one soldier who became Muslim and wrote their name, their address, maybe they wrote a new name that they took, an Islamic name, the date they took Shahada, etc. Every page was a new Muslim. And that was just in Dahran. Right? I was a new Muslim. Five months. Inside this Saudi cultural center, this Dawah tent, there was also something I found that was very interesting. It was a memorandum. I found this memorandum. It was a military memorandum. Right? It was signed by two generals. It was signed by the general of the Saudi Air Force. And it was signed by the general of the American forces. And this joint memorandum said that any American Muslim soldiers that were there in Saudi Arabia could get four days off from their military duties to go to Mecca, make pilgrimage. I was a new Muslim, I said, wow, I'm a new Muslim, I gotta go to Mecca once in my life, I'm gonna take this opportunity. There were already three converts in my unit that had converted to Islam there in Saudi Arabia. So these three new converts, myself also a new convert from five months, six months now, we applied, we set this application up, filled out this request, sent to a chain of command, and the colonel's like, what? You're not here to go to Mecca? We brought you as American soldiers, not so you could go on some religious spiritual pilgrimage. <laughs> Sir, this is a memorandum signed by the general. This is all American Muslims who are here can get this pass to go to Mecca. Proved. Can't go against the general. Right? So now, I'm on my way to Mecca, being escorted by some of the brothers who, were, who worked inside the Saudi tent. Air Force personnel, Saudi Air Force, some Saudi citizens, they escorted us, us escorted us to Mecca. Right. I'm still a young Muslim, five months. I became Muslim, I was just a simple Muslim. Still, my, my stereotype of Muslims was much like that of those in America and maybe here in the UK and in other places in the West. That when someone says Islam or Muslim, they think Arab, Middle East, South Asia, maybe in America, uh, Nation of Islam, Farrakhan, black Muslims from the hood, right? Still, that was my impression as a Muslim, a new Muslim who had took the Shahada based on the doctrine, right? But I believed in my heart, I believed in the same doctrine as all these others, so I can connect with them in that way. I'll go and make my pilgrimage, my Umrah. I'll be the only Chinese Muslim there. But when we got off the bus, the first large group of Muslims that I saw were other East Asian Muslims. A group of them. Maybe they were from Indonesia or Malaysia. East Asian Muslims. They had characteristic physical features like mine. I said, wow, the other East Asian Muslims. A lot of them. <laughs> and then of course there are Arabs there. Africans. And those four days, we had Muslims from Russia. I even met another Muslim from America. He was a student. He was studying in Medina. On that particular day, he was also happened to be making Umrah. And I was there, and I met an American Muslim. He's like, yeah, I'm from Jersey. He's like, ah, I'm from Jersey also. Right? So for me, that was an eye-opening experience. Diversity. I saw this real diversity in Islam. Something that I didn't really know existed, even when I became a Muslim. But it was something that was also reinforced as a youngster growing up in America. American people, most of whose ancestors and, 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 and family come from somewhere outside of the United States. Unless you're Native American. Right? That's the diversity we have in America. That's what's taught to us as youngsters. Right? But the real diversity I saw was in Mecca on this ordinary day. Not during Hajj. Not during the Hajj season. Not during Ramadan. Just any day out of the year in Mecca, I had this beautiful experience. Right? 
And yes, you should all go to Mecca and see the Kaaba and experience what, uh, what our brother was talking about. It's amazing. It's touching. You can't explain the words when you, when you see the Kaaba for the first time. Right? But that for me was my Malcolm X-like type experience. Seeing that diversity. That for me was inspiring. And as I returned back to that military base in Saudi Arabia, I said, hey, we got Muslims in the military now. We got a lot of converts. We got Jewish chaplains, Christian chaplains. Where are the Muslim chaplains? We didn't have any. So, I'm, I'm an officer. I graduated from West Point. I'm a new Muslim. Now inspired by my faith. Maybe one day I'll become a chaplain. And I would set out to do that. I left active duty, I left the military in mid-1993, hoping maybe one day I would be the first chaplain, first Muslim chaplain to serve the United States Army. Didn't happen. But by 2001, January, I did get the opportunity to return to the ranks of active duty as an officer and as a Muslim chaplain. I wasn't the first, but in January 2001, I was the newest. Right? That was my journey to Islam. And then that was my journey to becoming a Muslim chaplain. How much time do I got? Five minutes. Five minutes. Got to make a long story short. <laughs> 2001, I entered the ranks as a chaplain. Nine months later, 9-11. Tax on the World Trade Center, tax on the Pentagon. Fourth flight in Pennsylvania crashed. 9-11. Troops from America go and invade Afghanistan. Captured prisoners. Where did they bring them? Guantanamo Bay. Guantanamo Bay. Who do you think they would send as a chaplain to Guantanamo? A place where they were holding hundreds of Muslim prisoners? A Muslim chaplain. And we got our guy. Chaplain Yi. He's a West Point graduate. He's an officer. He's a lieutenant. He's got the right words. Gosh, even after 9-11, he said, whoever carried out these attacks whether they were Muslim or not Muslim, need to be brought to justice. That's our guy. They sent me to Guantanamo. I was a chaplain in Guantanamo Bay. Right. It was quite clear when I got to Guantanamo Bay, these hundreds of Muslim prisoners were being abused, were being tortured, in ways that I don't have time to go into today. But maybe if those who stay after, and maybe if we get together and have some time, I can go into some detail on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a more informal level. But I objected to those abuses. And when I objected to those abuses, what happened? The government, the US government and military then turned on me. I was thrown in prison. I was accused of being a terrorist, a spy for the suspected Taliban and Al-Qaeda prisoners held in Guantanamo, most of whom were not terrorists and were swept up in the wrong place at the right time. I was thrown in prison. I was treated just like the prisoners in Guantanamo, shackled the wrists, the waist, the ankles, in a suit of chains chains, right? The blackened out goggles that go over your eyes, yep, they were put on my eyes too. The devices that go over your ears to prevent you from hearing, this is something called sensory deprivation. Sensory deprivation. I was subjected to sensory deprivation and it was something that I knew about because I saw that's how they treated the prisoners at Gitmo. Right? They tried to charge me, or accuse me of being a terrorist, a traitor to my own country. Ultimately, I was released from prison in solitary confinement for 76 days. After those 76 days, none of those charges came on my account. They did try to charge me with what they called mishandling classified information. But when they couldn't even show, the government could not even show that I had classified information, even those lesser offenses were dropped. I was cleared, reinstated as a Muslim chaplain back at my home base, back in the United States. How long do you think it took for me to resign from the U.S. military? Not long. I tendered my resignation. I got an honorable discharge in January 2005. An honorable discharge. And even when I left the military, they gave me a second U.S. Army Commendation Medal. And it said, for exceptionally meritorious service. Right. How do you figure that one out? Right? I got an honorable discharge, another medal, 
after they had tossed me in the prison, accused me of being a spy, accused me of being a traitor, subjected me to sensory deprivation, took me away from my family, held me in solitary confinement for 76 days, 30 of which was during the month of Ramadan, back in 2003. The military knew, the US government knew they made a mistake. But today, no one in any official position of leadership has ever given me an apology. I'm out of time. I didn't even get to show some images. But inshallah, maybe we'll have some, some time during the Q&A. That's my story. That's my journey to Islam, my journey to become a chaplain. This was my ordeal that I went through as a chaplain at the United States, at that prison camp called Guantanamo Bay. It's something we got to close down. There are prisoners who have been in Guantanamo Bay now 10 years. 10 years. Do we have time to do some pictures? Take two, three minutes? Okay, let's go real quick. You want to flip the slides? Ten years, and this is why I really emphasize this. January 11th, 2012, we hit the 10th anniversary of Guantanamo. The first picture you saw was how prisoners being transported. This is Camp Hector. Slow down, slow down, slow down. I'll tell you when to, I'll tell you when to, I'll tell you when to flip. Alright. This is how prisoners were being transported to Guantanamo in the big military planes. Cargo planes, hooded and strapped, an American flag hanging over their head. That bugs me a lot, to see the American flag hanging over the head of how these prisoners are being treated. Next slide. Next slide. Right. One more. Camp X-Ray was the very first facility open. The camp was made of chain link fences. Next slide. You can see in this picture, the chain link fences that the prisoners would be held in. Here you see all the prisoners taken out of their cells, being made to kneel in sensory deprivation in the hot sun of Cuba. Next slide. A closer look at the sensory deprivation. They did that to me. See the blackened out goggles? The earmuffs? Maybe you can see it better here. I don't know. I was subjected to that sensory deprivation. But they didn't put the mask in my mouth. But they did for the prisoners in Gitmo. And it was often said at Gitmo that the prisoners coming to Guantanamo were so dangerous they might chew through the hydraulic lines of the planes to bring it down. That's how dangerous they were. We better cover their mouths. All right. Next slide. Camp X-ray, one more. A top look at Camp X-ray, an overhead shot, not a facility you would think human beings were held in but maybe more appropriate for dogs or animals. Next slide. By the time I got to Camp X-Ray, Camp Delta was in operation. That's the front gates of Camp Delta. In Camp Delta, the cell blocks were like, looked like this. There were about 15 or 20 of them. 48 cells in each cell block, made of strong steel mesh. Still a cage-like environment. Next slide. That's what it looked like inside the cell block. 24 cells on one side, 24 on the other, the long corridor. Each of those doors is a single solitary cell that holds the prisoner. If you go in the cell, that's what the cubicle looks like. Some kind of steel bed bolted to the, to the side there. An in-ground toilet, right? Here's how the military pitches this picture. Look how good the prisoners in Guantanamo have it. It's clean. The floor waxed and shines. Maybe they could eat off that floor. Look how clean it looks. They have this in-ground toilet that we give them, these Muslims, that they're culturally familiar with. A little water fountain that they could drink from or wash before prayer. Look how good we're accommodating Muslims in Guantanamo. We'll even put an arrow pointing to Mecca so that the Muslims can pray in the proper direction. A few extra packets of salt makes the food taste better. These in Guantanamo were, were referred to as comfort items. Comfort items. They're in Guantanamo Bay. We're making them feel comfortable here. Next slide. But really that's what they got. This empty cubicle cell flimsy plastic mattress. Next slide. Later retrofitted like this. Come on. The steel mesh that they look through every day, a much sturdy, strong mesh, again, gives the impression that you're in this cage. A detainee being escorted, escorted, we were ordered to refer to them as detainees, not prisoners. Because prisoners of war have rights. But the Bush administration from the very beginning said, they have no rights, we call them detainees. Camp 4 later built, 
for the nice behaving prisoners who cooperate with their interrogators, they could go to a camp like this and live amongst other prisoners. Very few ever got to Camp 4, where they can get out of the orange jumpsuits and they give them the nice white prison uniforms. A carrot stick, an incentive. Next. Camp Iguana was a separate facility in Guantanamo, which held the juvenile enemy combatants who were 12 years old. 12 years old! Boys held in Guantanamo as terror suspects. They were separated from the general population, held in a building called Camp Iguana. One of the juveniles in Guantanamo who was held in general population was this guy from Canada, Omar Khadr. He was 15 when he was picked up, or 14 when he was picked up, 15 by the time he got to Gitmo. Because he was 15, he was held in general population. Next slide. That's the young boy, the 14, Omar Khadr, when he was captured in Afghanistan. He's got big gaping holes in his shoulder. That's near, not where U.S. ammunition entered into his body, but where it came out. Telling you what? Shot in the back. The U.S. Army tore him up, then saved his life and brought him to Guantanamo. He's still in Guantanamo today. He's now like 24. Camp Echo is another facility, very isolated. This is probably like what you were in. You can't see sunlight in that cell. Very isolated. You don't even have access with another prisoner in the Camp Echo. Right? Later, Camp 5 was built. I wasn't there when Camp 5 was built. But look at it. Permanent prison. Heavy steel locking doors. Cement floors. This tells me Guantanamo was very permanent. Camp 5 cell looks like this. One more. Go inside. That's the Camp 5 cell. Right. And then Camp 6, a double, a double version of Camp 5. Again, very permanent facility. Okay. Camp No, or Camp 7. They call it Camp No because maybe it doesn't exist, is what they say. But that's where supposedly the 19 or 20 or so legitimate terror suspects who were brought from the U.S. CIA black sites were, when they were brought to Guantanamo, that's where they put them. Not with the general population, in this place called Camp 7, or sometimes they say Camp No, because nobody's supposed to know that it exists. Right. Interrogation room, very simple. A D-ring on the ground to shackle the prisoners in stress positions. And then go two more slides. One interesting aspect of the detainee medical facility is the force feeding chairs that are utilized to force feed prisoners who go on hunger strike and would rather die. The US military doesn't allow them to die, they force them in this chair, they take a tube, they shove it into the nose of the prisoner, and they force that individual to eat with a liquid diet so they don't die. Right. Real quick, we'll, we'll stop here, but this last picture is an image of a former prisoner, Samuel Hajj who used to be a cameraman for Al Jazeera. That's the picture that he drew of what it felt like to be force-fed while on hunger strike. Okay? So that just gives you an image, a pictorial of what it was like for me working as a chaplain down in Guantanamo, dealing with prisoners held in this condition. You can probably see why I objected to the abuse at a time when not much, not many people around the world knew exactly what was going on. That gives you an insight as to why they then threw me in prison and wrongfully accused me of being a terrorist. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to questions and hearing some more insight from our other panelists.